I, I want to welcome you all to UCLA. Uh, we really are worshiping God incredibly today. Um, you know, a while back I was taking a class and uh, I learned something really interesting. So the purpose as to why we actually have colored vision. So the purpose as to why we have colored vision is to be able to distinguish between different fruits. Essentially, in the Bible, in Genesis 1, all we had were fruits and vegetables, right? And so God gave us colored vision so that we would, from the jump, be able to distinguish what is good and what is not good and to have a variety of incredible fruits. Now, there's another biological function that we have, and that's hearing. Now, the Google definition for hearing is perceive with the ear the sound made by someone or something to listen or pay attention to. Now, you got to ask yourself, why did God allow us to have hearing? Well, he wanted to talk with Adam in the garden. The purpose of our hearing is so that we could listen to God speak to us. The purpose as to why we have hearing is so that we could hear the word of God. The purpose why we can hear is so that we could hear the message. The message about God. Come on, bro. That is the title of my lesson. Hear the word of God. Come on, bro. I know. Turn with me over to Romans 10. We're going to take a look at it. We need this. Bring it, bro. Romans 10, verse 14. The Bible reads, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Come on. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. You know, Paul here in Romans 10, he's really addressing the issue of unbelief in the Israelites. And so he's focusing a lot on faith and on believing the word. But he says, well, before somebody could even believe, before somebody could even have faith, they must do what? They must hear the word yeah. of God. Come on, yeah. God. Yeah. Preach. That's the foundation of how somebody's going to come to Christ. Come on. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. But you say, well, how are they going to hear the word? Someone has to preach to them. Yeah. Well, how can someone preach unless they are sent? What is Paul really trying to say here? He's trying to say that we need other people to help us get to Christ. Wow. Wow. There is no self-conversion. This is only possible with people involved in our lives. You see, it isn't about saying a one little prayer and boom, you're with God. It isn't about just saying, hey, I'm with Jesus and I firmly believe it. No, you need other people to guide you. Oh, no. All right, now. Oh, but what message, what message exactly is Paul here talking about? In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, you don't have to turn there. I'll go ahead and read this. It says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, okay. which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. Wow. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Mm. And you, with the help of wicked men, Put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And the devil said, Amen. You know, the message needs to be preached, and the message that is heard is the gospel. Wow. And this essentially is the gospel message. Bruce. This is the good news about Jesus. Come on, Christ. Bro, let's go. Come on, you know what does it say? Jesus is from God. Perfect. 
without any sin whatsoever. You ever get a perfect grade on your exam? Yeah. yeah. It feels pretty good, right? It's pretty awesome. You know, Jesus died on the cross, a man without any sin. He died on the cross, and he had each and every single one of you in mind. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, I think about a time where I first heard the gospel message. You know, I actually used to be an atheist. Wow. So I was, uh, I was born in Mexico. I was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco. Okay. Wow. And naturally, everybody in Mexico is automatically Catholic, yeah. but not me. But not you, though. But not me, though. I grew up extremely pagan. My family didn't want to take me to church. There was never a Bible around. I didn't grow up with faith. And so naturally, I grew up, and I got into a lot of sin. You know, I was uh, did the classic college lifestyle in high school. I went to my first frat party when I was a sophomore in high school. And from that point on, it was just rampant partying, rampant sin, and it led me absolutely nowhere. I remember reaching the epitome of what the world desires. Music festival after music festival, party after party, nothing. I was searching for happiness, but I was searching in all the wrong places. It wasn't until the word of God was preached to me. Wow. The word of God produced an undesirable knowledge of wanting to know God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I had the dream to want to simply be with God yeah. based on the gospel message. The word of God came into my life and it produced hope. Wow. Everybody here is desiring hope. And I know everybody wants hope. Who wants some hope? This is something we all want. But the world is seeking for this in all the wrong places. The world right now is without any hope whatsoever. The world right now is seeking for anybody to give them some sort of satisfaction. But the only place that they will ever get any sense of hope is from the Word of God. But you hear, you know, not everybody actually wants to hear the word of God. Not everybody is actually fired up about hearing the word. And that's the sad reality that we live in today. You know, in Acts 7, there was a man by the name of Stephen who was preaching the word. And some people listened. But for the most part, the religious leaders did not. Wow. I want to show you what happened. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Come on, Pot! Come on, bro. It's awesome. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Come on. Take us there, bro. It's terrific. The Bible reads When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. As the, at this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Wow. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Wow. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When they had said this, he fell asleep. You know, this is an incredible passage. And now Stephen here is in his dying moments, preaching his guts out and saying, hear the word of God. But the Pharisees and everybody else could do nothing but cover their ears because they didn't want to hear the word of God. They didn't want to hear Jesus Christ being preached. But that's not us today, right? No, no, no. We are those that want to hear the word of God, that we actually want our lives to be changed. We actually want to be transformed. We're not going to run from the world, but we're going to face it straight on and preach the word. The world needs those who 
are going to go out and preach the word because nobody will be able to see the word of God and hear it if you do not go out and do it. Come on. That is the challenge for each and every single one of us. We must go out into the lostness of the world and preach the word so that people like me can finally have that hope that they so much desire. I love you guys. Wow. Thanks, childhood. Sure. It was uh, May 21st, 2011. Okay. And if anyone remembers this day, the world was, so, was supposed to end. Um, oh. And I remember I was really nervous, I was really anxious, and I was fearful because I didn't want to die. I wanted to live a long life. Oh, yeah. And then I, I realized that, you know, the world didn't end. And we, we were all good. And, uh, it was just but a fear. Then comes uh, about a year and a half later, it's December of 2012, oh, and if anyone's so familiar with the, the Mayan Aztec calendar, we understand that this was supposed to be the end of the, end of the world as well. Oh. And so as a kid, a uh, year and a half later, I was really nervous and fearful once more. But I remember I, I did one thing that really produced in me a, a sort of comfort and, and peace. And, and what that was was that I looked at Matthew chapter 24, wow. verse 36. Wow. Uh, the, the Bible in Matthew 24, 36 says, No one knows that hour or time, not even the Son, only the Father alone, only God Almighty knows when the world is going to end. Exactly. Yeah. And I remember reading that as a little boy and just feeling a, just a, just a, a blanket of peace come on, come on me. Wow. And I felt comforted immediately by, the God, by God's word. And so I, I want to put before us something that I think it's pretty simple. What I think happened to me was, was, was not rocket science. I think that this was me reading the Bible at face value and believing it and having peace in my heart. This was me having a childlike faith. That is the title of my lesson today, A Childlike Faith. And, uh... I believe, guys, that the Holy Spirit is on the move this evening yeah. because my scripture is also at Romans chapter 10. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. And specifically, it's Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Okay. Here in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Come on, bro. Come on, Brady. The Bible says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. I love Apocalypse 7. Faith comes from hearing the message preached. Yeah. The message preached comes from the word about Christ, which is the Bible. Faith comes from the Bible. Yeah. Wow. And you know, this, this is something oh, that, that really was true for me as a kid, and it's true for all of us today. Faith comes from believing that value at face value. Yeah. Wow. You know, faith is not mystical. Oh, yeah. It's not magical. Oh, In wow. fact, it's, it's quite mathematical. Yes. Oh, 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 the, the more Bible you read, the more faith you have. The more Bible you read, the more faith you have. You know, let us not be astrological Christians. Let's, 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 not look for, let's not look for science. Our signs come from the Bible. The word is, it comes, faith comes from the Bible. Guys, we simply just need to get in our Bibles and have let this produce a faith in our hearts. Yeah. Wow. Yo, let's make sure, guys, that our quiet times are longer than my five to seven minute charges. Oh! Oh! No! No! That's so good. Kick us in the Bible. Yeah! In the, in the book of Genesis, okay. something, something profound happens. God comes down to an old man, Abraham, and tells him that he's going to be the father of many nations. And he's going to birth the child, and that child is going to produce many more child, children. And this is, this is quite crazy when we think about it. Abraham was an old man. He, he couldn't have, like, he's beyond the childbearing age. But he believed God's word at face value. And it was a credit to him as righteousness. In the same way, we have to, we have to, we have, to have the same childlike faith and believe God's, God's word at face value. You know, the Bible says in, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, that God has plans to prosper us, yes. not to harm us, give us hope in a future. 
No, in Romans 8, chapter 28, the Bible says that God works for our good in everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in John 10, 10, Jesus says he came to give life to the full. Yeah. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, do not, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is the faith that we need to have. We need to take it at face value. So let us... Uh, let us be those who possess a childlike faith. Amen. You know, I, I got to be the first to admit I've, I failed at this several times in my life. <laughs> you know, I remember uh, growing up, I, I love my parents. I'm really grateful for them. They really instilled the, the importance of God and going to church at a young age. And we would go to church almost weekly from the ages of like 5 to 15. It was something I did normally as a kid. And I loved it. I remember uh, for the longest time, uh, we'd go to service, and at, at, towards the end of service, the pastor would encourage us all to close our eyes. Mm-hmm. And we'd close our eyes, and it was at this point, and only at this point, that some like soft melody piano music would play <laughs> in the background. And really, it was like quite a quite a peaceful moment. You know, uh, I'm not much of a music guy, but it was it was awesome. And I remember um, for the longest time, I always wanted to raise my hand, and I always wanted to to take this public declaration of my faith and. And, and go to the back and like say this prayer or whatever. But I always, I, I could never, I could never muster up the courage to do it. Okay. I was always fearful. And so I remember one time I, um, I, I was, I was a special service. I went to my, my middle school service with my friend Alex, and I had made a, a, a commitment to myself that I was going to raise my hand, mm. and I was going to finally muster up the courage to go up front. And so at that time, the, 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 the melody plays on the piano. We're closing our eyes, and, yeah, and I raise my hand. And we go to the back, and it's about 10 of us, and they seat us down in a circle. And they tell us to, to pray this, this prayer of praying Jesus into your heart. Mm. Uh, and at that point, if you would have asked me, I would have said that I was saved. I would have said that I was a Christian because I felt good. It was very sincere. Yeah. And you know, I love my parents. They, they took us out to, to hometown buffet after it was a big deal. And, um, Come on. It's you know, the point is, is that I, I, I failed in my Christianity. That, that, that didn't lead to any... Any real change. Yeah. You know, um, I got something simple for us, guys. If we just get in our Bibles yeah. and really just take the Bible at face value and really apply it to our lives and study the Bible, yeah. then we'll succeed in our Christianity. Yeah. And I want to put us uh, a, a, a challenge for visitors. I want, to, I want to challenge us to study the Bible yeah. and see the plans that God has for you and take the, take the Bible at face value. Yes. Yeah. For disciples, I want to encourage us and challenge us to study the Bible yeah. and take this at face value and increase our faith and increase in our Christianity. Thank you guys. To God be the glory. Actually preach to you guys at Campus Devotion. Amen. Amen. We're not gonna waste no time. We're gonna get right on into it. All right. Tell me the Second Samuel chapter twelve. You, come on, brother. The title of my lesson is Confession, Your Greatest Weapon. Chapter twelve, verse one says, "The Lord sent Nathan to David when he came to him. He said, there was two men." A certain town, one rich man and one poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except a little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it all up, grew it up um, with his children, and he slept with with, in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now the traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of the sheep and cattle and prepared for a meal for the traveler who had to come to him. Mm -hmm. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one that was coming to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. And he must put pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. Oh, wow. So let me give you a little context for here, just really, really quick. You have uh, um, uh, David, and in chapter 11, David actually sees Bathsheba and he actually takes her to be his own, and she was married to Nathan, I mean to Uriah, I'm sorry, the Hittite, and then Uriah, Nathan, David accidentally, not accidentally, sorry, David actually um, kills Uriah. So when David kills Uriah, you have this big old mess that David has just conjured up, and now he has to kind of mask it up. So in chapter 11, this happens, in chapter 12, that she actually um, can see she gives birth to a child. 
But in this whole span of this, Nathan comes to him because David refused to get over it. Wow. For a whole nine months, David swept it under a rug that he killed somebody and actually took somebody's wife to be his own. Whoa. So what is, what is this coming to? Um, now we understand this timeline, but what does this mean? This means that for actually a whole nine, can you just imagine not getting over with something for a whole nine months? Can you just imagine the, that eating away at you for a whole nine months without even confessing? Wow. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Mm. Everything yeah. is laid bad to the one we must give account. So they was actually hiding something that God already knew. Yeah. Oh. So why did, he get, why did he get over with it? I believe it was because of fear. Wow. I grew up in my household, of course, black community, <laughs> and we had three rules uh, upon many rules. Uh, the first rule we had that if we go to the store, you don't look at nothing, don't touch nothing, because <laughs> I'm not buying nothing. I'm not buying nothing. Amen. 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 The second one was, you better not cry, or I'm going to give you something to cry for. <laughs> <laughs> and the third That's one true. was whatever happens in this house. Stay. <laughs> but just to be honest, guys, let me let you know what happened in my house. <laughs> It was molestation. Mm. Wow. It was hurt. Mm. It was physical wow. abuse. It was mental abuse. It was drugs. It was impurity. Mm. And all this stuff I was actually afraid to get open with because the family said that you shouldn't do it. Mm. Wow. wow. This stuff held me down. Mm. Wow. It held me down to a point where I was walking a life thinking that I was with God, but I wasn't open. And just like Nathan came to David and called him out on something that he wasn't prepared to get open with, I was met with a group of guys. Mm -hmm. And when we got to a study called The Cross, I was challenged to get open with all the, the, the gruesome, heartbearing, just horrible stuff that had happened to me since I was even 10 years old. Wow. And then I studied the Bible, and on November 1st, 2020, I was baptized. not confessing. Whoa. Whoa. What are you not getting open with right That's now? Wow. This confession about sin actually leads to the biggest confession, which is confessing that Jesus is Lord. Yeah. 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 What does this okay. mean? Confessing Good. means owning. Oh, and when you yes. confess Jesus is Lord, you're owning that you are, you, this, is, this word belongs to you. Yeah. This yeah. walk of life belongs to you. His words in the Bible, his commands, his commandments, his, his declarations, they all belong to you. But you cannot confess Jesus is Lord until you confess all that wickedness in your heart. And this is what happened to David. He literally got open with this stuff in verse 12. He says, you did this in secret, God said, but I will do these things in broad daylight before Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned. Wow. He owned it. Yeah. And we know that David goes on to being a man after God's own yeah. heart. Wow. So we're not going to be afraid to get open. Yeah. Right. We're right. not going to be afraid to confess. Man. If you are a disciple, guess what? Confession doesn't stop. Oh, no. Yeah. Confession is a continuous thing. You yeah. said that Jesus is Lord, so every single day it's going to be a trial and tribulation for you to be open and get that stuff out of your heart. Come on, come on, bro. If you're here visiting, you never studied the Bible. Guess what? You got some stuff in your heart just like we do. Yeah. I dare you to study the Bible so somebody can get that out. Yeah. I dare you to use the Bible as the weapon and as the knife and as the sword that's going to cut out that sin so that you can get stitched up and healed tonight. Yeah. I got a challenge for you. And everybody always does this, but I, I want to add a little more to it. All right. The challenge is to write a sentence. Oh, okay, bro, I wrote a sentence already. <laughs> All right. But this time, write a sentence in detail and share it with someone. Okay. Yeah. Share it. Sisters with the sisters, amen. Let me pray. Yeah. Brothers with the brothers, amen. But once you read in detail what you've been through, you get a chance to truly heal. Yeah. Once you're being real with yourself. Yeah. So what, what am I saying here? In 1 John 
chapter 1, verse 9. I'll close out here. Yeah, on. On. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. Amen. Without a confession of sins, there's no forgiveness. Yeah. And without forgiveness, there's no salvation. Amen. Come on. So I want to challenge you guys. Challenge confess the sin. Whatever it may be, so that you can actually confess that Jesus is Lord. It's an honor. You don't have to change. You don't got to repent. You don't actually have to leave everything to follow God. Oh, wow. strength, bro. You also don't have to go to heaven. The word repentance has such a negative connotation in our world today. Okay, It's seen as something negative. For some of us, for many people, it can be a trigger word. I'm here to change your perception of it entirely. The word itself in the Greek is metanoia, which means to change one's mind. Right. The title of my short charge for you here today is The Gift of Change. Wow. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, the gift of change. It says, repent, then in turn to your God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Wow. What an incredible passage of scripture. Yes, it is. Here we see that for one, when you repent, your sins are wiped away entirely. And after that, it says that you feel refreshed. But deeds are, your deeds are actually what prove whether you actually repented. In Matthew chapter three, verse eight, it says that you must bear fruit by keeping with repentance. In other versions, it says, Prove your repentance by your changed life. Wow. I really want to lift up a brother here today that goes by the name of Gerson Merlos. Yeah. And the reason why is because Gerson got met out just last week, saw that he was in an ungodly relationship. Wow. And when he was challenged only after the discipleship study, there was little to no hesitation about what he had to do and he acted immediately. Yeah. He broke up with his girlfriend. He moved out of his house, despite him being on the lease, and moved into the brother's household. And two days ago, he was baptized into Christ. If you're studying the Bible here today, you gotta be like Gerson and be willing to leave it all for God. But I believe that for some of us here tonight, I believe that God has made it clear for many of us here on what he wants you to repent of. Oh, yeah. But the challenge is to not waste any time. Sometimes we can get caught up about the things that we're going to lose okay. rather than the, the things that we're going to gain yeah. in following God. See, before coming to L.A., a little bit about myself, I'm four years old as a disciple now. Woo! I got baptized on December 9th of 2018. Let's go, bro. Uh, back in L.A., I did something that I never thought I was capable of doing. After I first became a disciple, I saw myself as someone who was quite spiritual, mm -hmm. somebody who wouldn't waver in my face. Yes, I had my struggles like everyone else, but I had a fall last year that I never thought I'd ever have. Mm -hmm. And I remember being at a point pre-discipleship pre where I was in my dorm room crying out to God. And I was miserable because I knew that without him, I was nothing, but I just didn't know how to find him. Wow. And I remember crying out and praying to God for two things specifically. For God to send someone in my life to teach me the Bible yeah. and for a family of genuine believers. Wow. Wow. And the next day I met Ola Inke Ola Bede. Yeah. Yeah. But fast, fast forward. Fast forward, things are going great. I'm starting to, my vision is starting to sharpen for God. Um, I'm in a dating relationship. And uh, for the first time in a long time, I did something that was a mockery to God. I didn't take my sin seriously. I gave in to impurity, immorality, 
I lost my dating relationship, my role and whatever role I had in the ministry, it completely destroyed me spiritually. And I got up quick, but my sins followed. And it wasn't until I got here to LA where I was smacked in the face and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I actually doing here? Can I actually do it again? Can I actually get back up? I didn't know if I could. But shortly after, and I'm grateful for all his mentorship, grateful for God and his patience, that I was able to get back up and know that that was not the end for me. And if I could fall and get back up, then no one can come to me and say that you can go to any place and say that you can't get back up to God. The power of a decision. Because ultimately, that's what repentance is, yeah. is a decision. Yeah. To illustrate that, let's say that you were on a plane from LAX, right here, to New York City. Right across the country right there. But let's say that that plane were to shift just 3.5 degrees south. That's 7.2 feet, 86 inches. It doesn't seem like a lot. I can walk that right now. But that slight change will actually take you from, rather than going to New York City, 222 miles away in Washington, D.C. That just goes to show the power of a slight decision. And you better believe that your decision to repent tonight, regardless of what it is, it will affect you in the long run. It will affect the trajectory of your life. It'll either bring you closer to your destined destination or further away from your God. Wow. See, we got to understand that Satan, the last thing that he wants for any of you to do is to change. He does not want you to change your sin of pride. He doesn't want you to repent in your greed. He doesn't want you to change in your impurity. If anything, he's fine. He has no problem with you sitting here right now. What he's threatened by is whether you're actually going to make a decision to change. And whether you're actually going to make a decision to repent. See, we're, we're, we're fed a false doctrine. Yeah. I grew up in a religious world that you don't actually have to come, that you don't have to change. In fact, you can come as you are, but you could also leave as you are. But not here. We got people who say, not here. Jesus Christ died for us. Not so that we can remain in our chains of comfort, but so that we can embrace change entirely and embrace the transformation that God has in store for each of us here tonight. So I pray and I hope that tonight you make a decision, quite simple, to embrace change and the gift of it. Thank you for letting me share. Esteban sharing so far, but that was powerful. That was, in fact, can you give a hand up for all of you? See, this evening we've already heard so powerfully about how we have to hear the word of God. Yeah. We've already talked about believing and repenting and confessing that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Yeah. But now we're going to talk about something a little more dicey, right? Yeah. We're going to talk about the most hotly debated topic yeah. in all of Christianity. We're going to talk about the most controversial thing okay. in all Christianity. Okay. That's why you guys ready this? We're going to be talking about the very point of salvation. We are going to be talking about the way of reconciliation. And the title of my charge tonight is The Way of Reconciliation. Here in the 21st century, I think not a lot of people argue that, you know, this is not a dark world we're living in. Honestly, in this world where we have 60% of marriages end in divorce. In a world where, just in the U.S. alone, 40 million adults are, are diagnosed as clinically depressed. And those are just the ones who are diagnosed that way. Countless others are, just don't want to actually get diagnosed. Every 40 seconds, and let this sink in, every 40 seconds someone commits suicide. Wow. Wow. 
That is the world we're living in. A world that is so far removed from God that it begs the question, what separates us man from God? How are we so far from God? Yeah, I'm glad you guys asked. Turn over to Isaiah 59. Come on, bro. Let's see what the Bible says here. Isaiah 59 says, verse 1, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. I, I love this scripture because it's actually comforting in the first verse here. It says that no one is so far away from God that they can't be saved. Wow. wow. No, there's no sin you can commit, no crime you can commit, no bad thing you could have done that leaves you so far away from God that wow. you can't repent, wow. as Esteban preached. Yeah, See, what separates us from God, if you look at verse 2 here, it says our iniquity separates from God. Synonymous to iniquity, sin. Right. Our very sin, the sin in our lives, is the wall between us and God. Wow. Yeah. It is the reason why the world looks the way it does. Wow. See, this scripture teaches that you can't have a relationship with God if there is sin in between you and God. So it begs the question, right? Okay. So if everyone's sin at some point, I think, you know, I think we can all agree. Yeah, we've all messed up at some point or another. Yeah. So if everyone sinned, but sin is the wall between us and God, yeah. how do we have a relationship with God? Oh. How do we do it? Hey. Right? How do we remove the wall of sin? On, how bro. do we get our sin forgiven? You guys are asking some really good questions here. I like this. <laughs> Turn over to Acts chapter 2. On, I'm going to answer these questions. I like this. Acts chapter 2. Jesus, bro. Mm. Man, love What's the crowd tonight. Come on, Caleb. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Come on. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Wow. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you your children, and for all who are far off, that's us, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. Wow. I love Peter. He lays it out for us. He breaks it down without debate. He says, you want your sins forgiven? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Guys, the moment of salvation the moment that our sins are forgiven, the moment that the wall of our sin between us and God comes crumbling down, yeah. is in the waters of baptism. Yeah. This is the way to be reconciled mm. with God. Wow. Wow. I remember a time in my life, um, I remember, uh, I, I grew up um, with a lot of siblings, I had two older brothers, two older sisters, and I was the youngest, right? So I, I messed around with my siblings a bunch, and we, we had fun, right? Everything. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was one time where, um, especially me and my, I have one older brother who's like 14 months older than me, so we're, we're always in our little squabbles, right? And there was one time, it got a little more intense, right? We were over at a, like, staying at a friend's place for a little bit, and there was a little grass hill. I remember it so vividly. A little grass hill, and we're just, we're going at each other, right? Mm. I said things I'm not proud of. <laughs> I probably did things that, you know, I'm not super stoked about sharing. You know, I, I mean... I'm not super sure. Honestly, I kind of erased parts of the memory right there. So I don't really know. It's all pretty blurry for me. Yeah. As far as I remember, uh, he started and I won the fight. So. Oh my God. Uh, he, he, he might share a different version of the story. I don't know. But he's not here tonight, so you're stuck with my version. <laughs> but once we got back to the house, we had a little bit of a, a little talk with the Lord. Amen. We had a little, a little talk between us. And I realized just how much I hurt my brother. Wow. I realized how much I had I'd sinned against him, mm-hmm. right? And you know, I did a little, you know, I'm sorry, all that stuff. I was pretty little. If y'all know Mickey Mousey, that was me and my brother. We were just as blonde as well. It was pretty bad. Um, we're going at each other, and I was like, look, I'm sorry. But I realized is that sorry is not enough mm-hmm. to restore the relationship. Yeah. I realized a cute little, oh, I'm sorry. That's not going to fix anything. Right? It's not going to actually restore, reconcile yeah. the two of us. Wow. Teach us the truth, bro. 
what I realized in that moment was that in order to actually reconcile my relationship with my brother, he had to forgive me. Ooh. He had to forgive what I had done, and then our relationship could come back together, mm. and we could be united as brothers again. Yeah. Well. And in the same way, yeah. until God has forgiven our sins, we cannot be right with God. We cannot have a proper relationship with God. And so in order to reconcile that sin, we must obey the Bible and be baptized. Amen. Amen. It's not enough to just pray Jesus into your hearts. It's not enough to just believe in God or go up front and you know, wave your hand or do all these things. It's not enough to be saved. You need to obey the Bible and do what the Bible says it takes to be saved. See, I grew up believing. See, there's a lot of teachings about baptism. I grew up believing, you know, baptism. Outward sign of an inward grace. Oh, no, right? I grew up believing that it was like, you know, some extra credit Christianity thing. It was the hardcore guys, right? right? I grew up believing that it was like sort of the, the coming out version of Christianity. We're like, yeah, I'm a real Christian now. I got baptized. That's what I thought. That's what I thought baptism was. But when I sat down and I studied the Bible myself, yeah. I looked at what does the Bible say baptism truly is. Right. Mm. I saw that's not at all what the Bible teaches. The what? Bible teaches that baptism is the point of salvation. Wow. The Bible teaches that baptism is the point where you go from hell bound to heaven bound. Yeah, I said it. I said it. See, when I first learned this, I, I didn't want to admit it, but I, I didn't want to admit the fact that these guys are right. I was trying to like squirm my way around it like, okay, well, is there any way I could use the Bible to say the Bible's wrong and, and try and contradict it and, and find some way because I just didn't want to admit that maybe, possibly, just maybe, maybe my whole life I would believed a lie. Yeah. I didn't want to believe that this entire time I, I wasn't actually, I didn't know the truth about how to really be saved, right? And Eventually, I humbled down to the scripture. I said, you know what? Whatever the Bible says, let's just do that. Come on. I studied the Bible, yeah. and I decided I'm going to become a real disciple. Yeah. I'm really going to repent, yeah. and I am going to get baptized. Yeah. So if you're a guest this, morning, this evening, and you, you maybe you've heard about these Bible studies, maybe you've done a couple of these Bible studies, I want to encourage you, set up a Bible study every day. Study the Bible, yeah. learn what it means to be a true disciple, and get baptized this week, and learn the biblical way of reconciliation. I love you all. Yeah. All right, wait, are you guys still fired up tonight? Yeah. You know, my Bible says in Matthew 24, verses 12, Verses 13, it says, the one who stands firm to the end right. will be saved. Oh. It's awesome you've heard the message. Nice. It's awesome you believe it. Yeah. And you've even confessed, you repented, and you've even gotten baptized. Wow. But it means yeah. nothing if you don't actually persevere to the yeah. very end. Oh. And I... Awesome. I'll be giving the charge to preach about perseverance. Okay. Turn with me to Acts chapter 14. It says in verses 21, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Let's go. The title is No Suffering, No Christ. Wow. You know, you guys got to understand, biblical Christianity is not like your typical Christianity of the, of the 21st century today. Yeah. Biblical Christianity was not a closet Christianity. Whoa. Biblical Christianity preached everywhere they went, in every city. If you read the book of Acts, you have titles in this city, in Lystra, in Derby, in Iconium, and preaching the word of God wherever they went. Yeah. Wow. But one thing they understood, that with great impact comes great suffering. Wow. You know, in order to persevere, we need to suffer yeah. in something. Yeah. Hey. 
And that's why the scripture says we must go through many hardships wow. to enter the kingdom of God. Yeah. You know, I too heard the message one time. Amen. I heard the message in the beginning. I believed the message. I confessed that Jesus is Lord. I repented, became a disciple, and got baptized on May 20th of 2018. Wow. But man, who would have who would I would, who would have thought that Christianity would be this hard? You know, as a disciple, it is it is quite hard to be spiritually minded. Because we spent so many years thinking the way that Satan taught us to think. Wow. You know, as disciples, you have battles without, with persecution and people accusing you yeah. all day and all night, right? Yeah. But you also have battles within. Yeah. You know, for me, you know, I, I moved down here with a bunch of the other disciples from San Francisco. And uh, moving down here has been challenging. Oh, amen. It's been challenging, and God has been really refining my faith and testing my true motives through by my faith. And it exposed a lot of things in my heart that I had no idea existed in my heart at all. Um, a lot of, like, just, just comparing myself and struggling really with what the, the role that God has assigned me here in LA. Yeah. When, you see, God exposed so much in my heart, but God, I believe that he's not trying to do this to see for himself. Mm. God already knows what's in your heart. Wow. But God, he did this so that he would show you the blind spots in your life. Wow. Yeah. You know, I'm so grateful for all my friends and all my uh, leaders here. I'm so grateful for all I Inca. Yeah. 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 Um, because ultimately God through them and through the scriptures and having quiet times and just fighting for my relationship with God, he showed me that I'm exactly where I need to be. Wow. And I know that we're all going through something. Amen. That the suffering at the end of the day, the Bible says in Romans 5, suffering pers uh, produces perseverance, yeah. perseverance, character, yeah. and character gives us hope, and it never disappoints. Yeah. Come on. You know, I understood something after I went through all those trials and I've been open about them. That at the best reward I have is at the end of the day, is just Him. Yeah. And you know, Jesus is awesome. Yes, he He's powerful. Yes, he he raised the dead. He walked on water. Right. He preached with authority. Yeah. He resurrected after he died. Oh, it's God. easy to love that Jesus. Yeah. But do you love the weak Jesus? Oh. The suffering Messiah. Damn. The one seemed helpless on that oh. cross. Yeah. Even though he had total power to get himself down from that cross. Let's go. And Convince the people that he's actually from heaven. Yeah. You know, we all are get super tempted when we're suffering to get down from the cross. Yeah. But just like how Jesus, even though he was offered the goal, which was a numbing agent when he was on the cross, we must imitate and persevere and, and, and arm ourselves with the same attitude as Jesus yeah. and actually fight to sit through the suffering and sit through it with God. Yeah. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw up everything that hinders Amen. and the sin that so easily entangles. Wow. And let us run with perseverance yeah. the race marked out for us. Yeah. You know, the Bible here is trying to get us to understand something. Yeah. That the people in the Bible... The people that got you this book yeah. did not just sit around and live lavishly. Wow. Did not live a comfortable lifestyle. Yeah. This book is covered in blood yeah. just to get it to you. Yeah. And some of you, some of you, this, some of you that have been here for the first time today have been shown some faces mm. of, of weirdness. Like, but I've never heard the Bible being preached this way. Wow. But this is what's actually in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. These people died for their faith. Yeah. You had Peter being crucified upside down. Some of them were uh, uh, dragged around the city until their, until their bodies became into pieces. Wow. And the Bible says in the next verse, fix your eyes on Jesus, wow. the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the God. Amen. You know, the Bible says here, Jesus went to the cross with joy set before him. Wow. It wasn't the cross that made him mm. joyful, but what came after the cross, what came after the sufferings. I believe as Jesus was enduring the pain of the cross, he fixed his eyes Amen. on the only images yeah. Yeah. which were your faces and seeing you getting a chance to hear, believe, confess, repent, yeah. get baptized, and persevere to the end and make it to heaven, to God be the glory.